Welcome to Breakaway. Today's guest is one of the pioneers of the UFC. He goes by the nickname the Huntington Beach Bad Boy, and he's here to tell us all about how he put the UFC on the map, how his fighting days prepared him for politics, along with what he plans to do next in his career. I'm John Root, and this is Breakaway. Welcome to Breakaway. Sitting on the couch right over here, we have a UFC legend, the Huntington Beach bad boy, Tito Ortiz. Welcome to Breakaway. Thank you, appreciate having me on the show. <laughs> we got producer Brian here. So let's just talk about the UFC. So you were a pioneer for the UFC. You helped build it into what it is today. I love the UFC, Brian does. We talk about it in the office um, all the time. But when you think about that, you're known as a, a pioneer. Do you agree with that? What do you uh, think? To a certain extent, yeah. I mean, I was kind of one of the outspoken stars of it. You know, I kind of understood uh, talking trash, but you got to back it up. You know, <laughs> I think uh, winning the world title and defending it five consecutive times helped that a lot. I mean, fighting for 16 years with the UFC, it was a, a, a long uh, progression just to watch the sport grow. But guys like Hoist Gracie, Ken Shamrock, you know, uh, God, Randy Couture, uh, Dan Severin, guys like that who I think were the forefathers at the beginning of it. Mm -hmm who kind of got it to push in the beginning. But guys like myself, uh, Randy Couture, Chuck Liddell, were the next generation, yeah. and of course, and had two generations after that since then. So um, I was from the beginning to the middle, um, almost to the end uh, until 2014 when I left. Yeah. But uh, I, I've been through the thick and thin of all of it. I know for me, I, I'm a horrible trash talker. I was never good at that <laughs> in sports, but that's one thing that people just, they either loved you or hated you because of your trash talk. But it added that entertainment value and got people into the UFC. They're like, Tito, like you talk about Ken Shamrock oh, laughing at my, him. <laughs> my favorite moment of your career was that press conference where you just die laughing at him trying to trash talk you. <laughs> well, it came to a point where it was like, uh, what do I do? I get him and punch this guy in the face? Or, uh, <laughs> do I just laugh it off and wait until the next day? And so I just laughed it off and wait until the next day. Have you always been good at trash talk? Or is no, that something you actually, had to learn? You know what, as a kid, I was uh, very conservative, very, you know, mild spoken. I very shy. Um, I think I was just watching Hulk Hogan, watching uh, Muhammad Ali as a kid growing up. I was like, you know what, well, if I get that opportunity to be in that position, I'm going to be that person. It was, it was just uh, once the lights turned on, it was just like camera action and, you know, but once again, I had to back it up when it came to competition. I had to do the work prior in uh, training, you know, training six days a week, uh, seven, eight hours a day. I just had to really put my body through hell to perform uh, behind the camera and on a stage and, you know, um, put my life on the line. And hey, you are an entertainer in and out of the octagon, but in the octagon, when you were digging graves for your opponent, where'd that come from? Because that, that's got to be one so, of the most legendary moves. Yeah, so actually I was at a, a, a Muay Thai event probably about a month before the fight when I fought um, Evans and I, I was watching it and I was like, this guy just did this before the match. And he like literally walked to the guy, the guy standing in the corner of a kickboxing event and he like digs the grave in front of the guy and grabs <laughs> him by so his face good. and like throws him in like imaginally. But, walks to his corner and then the fight started and the guy ended up knocking him out and doing that exact same thing. I was like, that's it, that's what I'm gonna do. And I did it and it stuck and I just kept doing it from that point out on. How do you compare your rivalry to Chuck Liddell to rivalries now? Because obviously we've seen a lot of McGregor uh, and Poirier and then there's been Cormier and John Bone Jones. Um, if you try to compare I think the, the uh, uh, Chuck Liddell one, that was more fabricated. That was more of a setup through the UFC and Dana. Mm -hmm. I think that wasn't really the true stuff because me and marketing Chuck- Marketing ploy. It was a marketing yeah. ploy. It was just to make me look bad. They just tried to make Chuck look like the superstar guy. Um, he got the better of me. You know, he was a better fighter at the time. But the true hatred that it was animosity towards each other was me and Ken Shamrock. You couldn't make that up. That was from the beginning. That was before the Petitas and Dana White was even a part of UFC. That was the beginning when it was the Lions Den, uh, back when Bob Meyerowitz owned the company, because it was me and Tank Abbott who were a training team. And then it was the Lions Den, and we hated We always talked back mm -hmm. and forth. But that was just something that could not be fabricated. It was real from the beginning to the end. Uh, and thank God I won 3 0. But at the same time, you know, the Chuck Liddell one was more of a setup. It was, uh, trying to make two friends hate each other the whole time. And Chuck could honestly do it because he was part of the business of UFC. He was listening to Dana. And um, I just, I assumed him as my friend. I was like a really close friend. I mean, he stayed at my home. I'd go to his home up in San Luis Obispo. Mm -hmm. But it just uh, was about the money to him. I mean, to him, it was uh, not a friendship. And it kind of showed his true colors. And it's sad. Um, at the end of the day, you know, I'm an honest man. I try to be respectful to my friends. I try to be cool to my friends, but uh, he just kind of threw me under the table and friendship was gone. And, you know, by the 
second to third fight, then there was animosity there a, a lot compared to the very first one. It was something I didn't want to do, but I got pushed into it because Dana said I was afraid of him. UFC said I was afraid of him. And it was never the point of being afraid of anybody at all. It was just um, at that point, we were making maybe 2% of what they were doing in revenue. And uh, to me, that wasn't um, fair. I, I didn't see that fair as a competitor. And as a businessman, I wanted to make sure that, you know, I was getting a chunk of the pie and then the whole thing. And they made sure that never happened. And they still make sure that doesn't happen. Yeah, well, I mean, with Dana as your manager early on, you kind of knew how he operated. So, like, you, you were... Try, just trying to do exactly what he did, you know, get a bigger piece of the pie. 100%. I mean, I, I, at the end of the day, I mean, I'm not a business management. I mean, I went to school to be a physical education major. I want to be a resource teacher. I want to be a, a wrestling coach. And I understand business by watching other people work business. Mm -hmm. And that's how Dana was. Was this the way I do it? If you don't like it, you go somewhere else. And that's why I thought I could do the same thing, too, against him. He didn't like that. I mean, of course, it's like two, having two alpha males in a room. Uh, you know, we're going to yeah. battle against each other, battle against each other. And... Um, that's the way it turned out, and I got the bad end of the stick. But, uh, you know, at the end of the day, I, I, I could look in the mirror and I could have integrity for myself because I was, you know, I had to fight for my name. Yeah. Finally, do you feel like the way the UFC is now, is it more than you envisioned? Do you still like it? Do you love the way it's gone? Because obviously you've gone through quite a bit, and you almost had to be the sacrificial lamb, it sounds like, it, in certain yeah. aspects. But a do you like where aspects. it's at? Um, yeah, you know, it, I think it's exciting. Uh, the, the competitors now are just so well-rounded, so well-versed in, you know, jiu-jitsu, wrestling, kickboxing. You know, um, it's just amazing to the athletes now. They're kids who are six, seven years old that have been training through their whole life or now that are competing at 19, 20, 21, 22, that are amazing athletes. Uh, back when I was, it was just either a wrestler who was learning how to box, uh, you are a wrestler learning jiu-jitsu, or you're a jiu-jitsu guy learning how to uh, wrestle. Uh, but now it just seems like it's a full, full sport. I really don't see it just as the UFC, I see it as the competitors in general, each one of the individuals. And it seems like the UFC has really prepared you for your political career. We're going to dive into that next. Yeah. So I'm excited to talk about that, exactly how that political career got started and how the UFC instilled some values and trying to beat up some political opponents must have been a little bit wild. We'll talk about that next. I'm John Root and this is Breakaway. Welcome back to Breakaway. It's time to go one-on-one -on -one with UFC legend Tito Ortiz. We were just talking about last segment, how it seems like your UFC career has really prepared you for jumping into politics. And it seemed like politics was maybe your new octagon. Is that true? Um, I kind of didn't really see it as a political career. I just wanted to help Huntington Beach. Mm -hmm. Being born and raised in Huntington, um, I just seen how it just was dwindling. You know, the homeless was an uprise. Uh, it just seemed like it was just made more divided. And how could I help uh, our city? How could I help it keep it clean? You know, the streets, uh, the homeless, trying to uh, get them help at the navigation center. And I thought I'd run for city council. I didn't really understand what I was getting myself into, just mm -hmm. because of uh, on the political side, you you got to kind of bend to what they want to say, what they want you to say. And I'm an honest person. I got to look in the mirror. I got to brush my teeth and I say, have I done something good today? Have I done the honest thing today? And there came to a point where there was unions coming to me and saying, well, you got to do this for us. You got to do that for us. I'm like, well, that's not the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. You're putting people in danger by doing these things. And they said, well, that, that's just the way it is. <laughs> yeah. I'm not that type of person. I'm yeah. an honest man. And, um, you know, at the end of the day, I had to, not had to, but I sue myself as being a Republican just because the values I have. And when they started attacking me nonstop, uh, my children uh, were in school. They got to go back to school after the whole COVID thing started going mm -hmm. away a little bit. Uh, and I said, okay, well, they wear a mask. That's fine. Then my son comes to me two days later and he says, dad, I've had a headache all day. He goes, every time I pull my mask down, my teacher's yelling at me. And mm -hmm. my other twin son, he's like, yeah, dad, like our friends are making fun of us. We pull our mask down and telling us, oh, we got cooties. And it's like, this is not the type of mentality I want my children to be around. Mm -hmm. um, and as I've known that the mask, people take it off, they put it down on the table, they pick it back up, they put it on, they put it hanging from their um, visor, they're putting it in their pocket. Now in a um, medical environment, in a hospital, doctors are changing them every time they change room. Mm -hmm. Now when people wear it out throughout the day, everything that they get on their hands, everything that's in the air, yeah. if 
they're gonna get sick, they're gonna get sick from the mask they put back on. So for my children, I want their lungs to grow, I want them to be in a healthy environment, and I want them to have a mask on their face the whole day. And so when my son said that he was having a headache and so forth, I said, okay, you're not wearing a mask. So they went to school, didn't wear a mask, they walked into the class, they got through the first period, got through the second period, then I got a call from the principal on second, or third period, mm -hmm. and I said, your, your boys need to wear masks. I go, I'm sorry, that I can't have them wearing masks. It's not healthy for them. Yeah. And um, as they were coming out, uh, NBC News was waiting for him coming out and they put him on the Jeez. news. Uh, when they did that, I uh, kind of had a, not a final straw because there's a few other things situations came about and I said, you know, the, um, I can't have the safety of my children be put on uh, national television. And then... Because um, what I think too is like in the UFC, you dealt with some pretty vicious opponents. Yeah. And, but it was just you in that ring. Yeah. And then once you decide to get to the political side of things in Huntington Beach, you're representing... Uh, the entire city, you're representing your family, and you're bringing people, it seems like, into this political ring with you, and you're doing everything you can to protect them. Yeah, I, I think I kind of uh, pulled the screen behind the wizard, <laughs> and they didn't like that. Yeah. You know, uh, at, uh, at city council, we had to vote for uh, the gay um, LGBTQ flag to be flown on, uh, was it in June, uh, at city hall and downtown by the pier. And I voted yes. I mean, I have gay friends. I have no problem with that. But just don't press it on my children. I have yeah. no problem. That's that's our right as Americans, okay? And so Huntington Beach Police Department has done an amazing job. Last year when BLM came down, they tried to uh, thrash downtown Huntington and said they're going to burn it down. And they actually helped us and the citizens of Huntington to not push, and that happened. So I was like, thinking in my mind, let's make August um, HBPD Appreciation Month yep. um, and bring it on the dais to vote for it. And before I could even get it on it, uh, I get a call from the city manager. I get a call from the um, chief of police saying that we cannot do this. I go, what do you mean we cannot do this? He goes, that's a sign of uh, racism. <laughs> the blue line flag. It, it hurt me yeah. because I have a lot of officer friends who work their butts off to protect our city. Huntington is one of the most safe cities in America. But once again, I was just trying to give appreciation to our officers. And they said that, that the blue line flag is a sign of white supremacists um, and they can't do that. So I got sideswiped by the chief of police, by the city manager telling me I could not do that. And it just didn't make sense to me. Um, there was another issue of saying that uh, I had uh, EDD, the um, stuff that I pay into for mm -hmm. my taxes yep. for when I haven't worked because I didn't work for 18 months. And I thought, you know, maybe I could make five or 10 grand from the state that I pay into all my taxes, yeah. my 50 percent of my money that I've made. And I made a lot of money through my career. And uh, I made, uh, what was it, $170 a week for about four months. And they attacked me. And this is private information. Yeah. I want everybody to know this because this is private information. And I pay into this. This is a part of the plan uh, pandemic. And I'm going to say pandemic because that's true. Everybody's saying it the whole time that this is what you pay into if something like this happens and you should be able to get back from the government this is why you pay so much taxes well they thought they'd make use me as a, a scapegoat of just saying uh, this guy is trying to get money from the government and he has all the money in the world he owns a four million dollar house mm -hmm. you know he owns three businesses and um so people understand that I still pay for my mortgage. Yep. I still pay for my mother's home. I, I pay for my children. And I work my ass off to be a proud American, to pay my taxes. And I'm not trying to get over anybody. I'm not trying to rip off the government, anything at all. But when they push that towards me, I say, you know what? This is not for me. Making 1200 bucks a month in city council isn't paying my bills. It's not worth the dragging my name through the mud. And they did. And um, mm -hmm. that was my political stuff. I had to walk away from it. It's, uh, I'm too honest for it, and I, I just try to do the right thing to help my city, and it didn't work. But at the same time, um, you know, I saw how vicious it truly was. And yeah. if I was a billionaire like Donald Trump, uh, I could have stayed in there and I would have still battled. Yeah. But once again, when you don't work for 18 months, uh, it kind of digs into your savings, and I don't want to lose everything that I built uh, over a 24-year career. And yeah. it's just one of those things. I'm back into work. I'm back working. I'm doing movies. I um, just got done fighting. I'm, uh, it's just... Um, as this pandemic kind of slows down more and more and kind of realizes it's more of a political scam. Um, hopefully more people wake up. Hopefully yeah. more people stand their grounds, you know? Well, I think we can appreciate that you've stood your ground too. And like you put yourself in a new ring in a new octagon and took a lot of vicious hits. You yeah, and, and you I and couldn't hit him. back. That was a problem. Yeah. I wish I could have. I wish I could have hit back. And, you know, I think the, the, the length that I could have hit back would just kind of show of how dirty uh, the left truly are. Coming up next, we're going to talk about 
Tito Ortiz's fighting career now just had a fight a little while ago with Anderson Silva, and we're gonna talk about where he's going next. I'm John Root, and this is Breakaway. Welcome back to Breakaway. We are here with UFC legend Tito Ortiz. We're keeping it going. Producer Brian is back. So you had a fight on 9-11 with Anderson Silva, boxing match, just using the fist. How do you feel after the fight? My pride hurts a little bit. Uh, <laughs> I think anybody who competes uh, and believes they can win uh, and when they don't win and they lose, you know, the way I did, uh, pride hurts, heart hurts. Uh, but you know, I, after four weeks of training, it was, uh, I got what, you know, I, I could put into it. You the cut a lot thing, of weight the, too. I was the hardest thing I, I think I've ever done was cut the 40 pounds in four weeks. Oh my gosh. Yeah, I got down to 200 pounds. Uh, when I started, I got the call from uh, the Triller. If I'd fight Anderson, I said, yes, of course. And they said, but uh, the fight's at 195 pounds. I'm like, okay, I oh stepped on the God. scale. I was 241. I was like, uh, yeah, I'm gonna say yes because I haven't worked in 18 months and I need to compete. And it's against one of the best uh, strikers in MMA history. I, I liked the challenge, like, give me a challenge, and I did. And the biggest challenge was cutting the weight. You know, um, I was running four miles a day, seven days a week. Uh, I was uh, sparring three days a week uh, for those four weeks. It was a very, very challenging camp. But I didn't get an opportunity to be prepared for the fight. I was yeah. getting prepared for the fight. It mm -hmm. wasn't, I was getting prepared for a camp. It was, uh, it was never just, okay, I'm in great shape. Now we got four weeks to train for the fight. Mm -hmm. It was, all right, here's four weeks to train to get ready for a fight that's boom, already here. And you know, it was, it was, it was very challenging, just mentally, physically. Um, the things I went through was torture. It was mental torture. Um, you know, when the last three days when I was cutting weight, I think I had one solid meal and that solid meal was a salad and it was, it was vicious. Um, people don't understand pain is when you're sitting there. I was sitting there at 200 pounds, 0.1 ounce, um, and I had 0.1 ounce to lose, and I had no more sweat, and my body was just pins and needles from head to toe. Mm -hmm. I was hot, like heat stroke feeling, because I was in a sauna blanket. Mm -hmm. I had literally had nothing left, and I remember uh, walking downstairs to go to the weigh-ins, and I'm sitting on the couch, and I was just like, I look at the athletic commission, I said, please, can I please weigh in? I'm like begging this guy, can I please weigh in right now, please? And he's like, well, we got 15 more minutes. I'm like, I don't know if I can last 15 hey, more minutes. I don't, minutes. Got oh 15 minutes. I don't have 15 more, please. So they talked to each other back and forth. They came over and said, all right, Tito, come on. Yeah. And I weighed in, it was 200 pounds on the dot. Oh, man. <laughs> and that was my max weight I could weigh, 200 pounds. Yeah. Uh, he got 20% of my purse. Uh, for that, I didn't give a shit at the point. It's a lot of money, but still, I didn't even care. I was gonna kill myself. I mean, I gotta take care of my children. I gotta, you know, I got a family to take care of. So I was like, you know what? I'll give twenty percent. That's fine. And that was how many days before the one fight? One day before the one fight. Day. One day before the fight. <laughs> wow. And uh, I went from two hundred pounds to two twenty-five in about six hours. But Holy uh, smokes. you know, Anderson was the better man that night. You know, I made a mistake. I just I was flat. I just wasn't there, and I was competing in a sport that I'd never done before. I'd never yeah. been strictly boxing. Yeah. Um, he caught me with a good, uh, good right hand. Um, I kind of turned my back to him a little bit and hit me twice behind the back of the head, which were legal. Um, but you know, he was the better man that night. Uh, I kind of had to lick my wounds. Uh, but you know, at the end of the day, I was able to take care of my family and. Uh, I'm able to fight another day. Yeah, I love that. But what I loved after the fight too is you're you're leaving, you're getting on the flight. There's a little yeah. bit of a flight debacle, and who gives up their seat in first class? Anderson Silva for your lady. Yeah. So uh, I, I had the first class ticket. She got a first class ticket. We we both had first class tickets on the way home. But they switched her ticket and they put her in coach. And Anderson was sitting next to me. And uh, his manager is like, Tito, don't worry about it. I'll let Anderson sit in the back. I was like, no, no, wow. no that's fine. He goes, no, Anderson, it's okay. So as we walk up and I go, oh, Anderson, I'm sitting next to you. He goes, okay, your, your, your fiance could have my seat. I go, Anderson, thank you very much. And he goes, I have nothing but respect for you, man. What a classy goes, move. That a makes classy like move. I, 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 I have a new respect for him for sure. Mm -hmm. I had complete respect. And she was just like, thank you so much. And I thought about it and I was like, but he got 20% of my purse. So <laughs> yeah. I guess that's really, not, I mean, it's actually good of him to do that, but I guess I kind of paid for it at the end of the day. I mean, <laughs> that was a $200,000 ticket. <laughs> but I mean, at the end of the day, uh, he was a good man for him to do that. He didn't have to do that. But, yeah. but we're talking about what's coming up next too. You you called out Logan Paul. Yeah, <laughs> you uh, said we both yeah. lost our last fight. Like, let's, let's get it going. Why not? Um, 
I'm not a boxer, he's not a boxer, he's trying to be a boxer, I'm trying to be a boxer, that'd be great. I still want to compete. I, I just, that just left a really bad taste in my mouth. I, I just feel like I have so much more. Um, I wish Trill would give me an opportunity to have a full training camp, not a four week training yeah. camp. Let me fight somebody at my level in the boxing level and uh, Logan would be great. I think it'd be a big money fight. I think we could sell the hell out of it. You know, um, I would like to punch him in his face. Why not, that'd be good. <laughs> I, mean, I know, especially if you follow Logan Paul. Right. I'd be watching that for sure. That'd be exciting. But hey, Logan Paul, you heard the man. He, yeah, he wants to fight. I would love I would, to see it. Everybody would love to see it. But coming yeah. up next, this guy's going to be on the hot seat for the 40-second shot clock. I'm John Root, and this is Breakaway. Welcome back to Breakaway. UFC legend Tito Ortiz on the hot seat. Rapid fire questions, 40 second shot clock. Ryan, you're ready to rock. I am ready, set, go. Favorite fight? Uh, Ryan Bader. If you could have any superpower, what would it be? Flying. If you weren't a fighter, what would your profession be? Uh, wrestling coach. Favorite place to eat in Huntington Beach? Sushi on fire. Dream car? Rolls Royce Phantom. Ooh, you can fight. It. Anyone, oh, you had it. Hey, oh. If I, anyone past or present, who would it be? Uh, Muhammad Ali. <laughs> Go to post fight meal? Sushi. Favorite song of all time? God, of all time. <laughs> or your current jam? Um, At the buzzer. Oh my gosh. <laughs> we, we got him stumped. We're stumped here. We got him stumped. 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 <laughs> Let's get it on Marvin Gaye. Let's go. I love that's a great way to finish. Yeah. That is the 40 second shock. Love it. Let's get it on. Well, that is all the time we got. UFC legend Tito Ortiz. Thanks for joining us. Producer Brian, always a good time. Boom, baby. But don't forget to like, comment, and share this episode so we can keep the conversation going all week long. You know, I'm John Root, and this is Breakaway.